I'm here today to give a talk called Closing the Materials Loop, What Every Girl Should Know. And this was developed as part of a class, so it's actually not only my presentation, but a collaboration with a bunch of people. So what do I mean when I say the material loop? Hopefully there's some stuff in here that we can learn and apply to the Icelandic situation. But the material loop is essentially a story of all the stuff that we have and buy and eat and drive in and sleep on and sit on and use in our everyday life. So the story starts at the raw material extraction end of things. This is harvesting and mining and all that stuff where we take natural resources out of the ground and just, it's the taking stage, right? And after we take, we ship. We ship all the stuff to the next stage, which is the production stage. This is where the factories come into play, where we manipulate raw materials and raw natural resources into products, into things that we buy. And after the factory, the stuff is moved again to a distributor, a store, or a place where we, the consumers, go and buy the stuff. And after we buy the stuff, we take it home, and then we use it in our house, and we think it's just grand. And then when we're done with the stuff, we throw it away, and it goes into the landfill. OK, so as you might imagine, there are environmental atrocities happening, obviously, everywhere around this loop human rights violations happening everywhere around this loop. And all across the cycle, there are opportunities for us to start doing things better, especially if we consider the fact that we live on one planet, one pretty small planet, with finite natural resources. We can't keep taking and taking and taking on this end. And a finite amount of space, which means we can't keep dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping on that end. So. As I mentioned, this was developed as part of a collaboration. And what's funny is that the collaboration we realized within about 10 seconds of our first meeting was a bunch of women, like a group of probably eight women. And we're looking around at each other thinking, this is kind of weird. It's not usual that you would get a group of girls. So we decided instead that we would look at this material cycle through the eyes of us, through the eyes of women, and say, what? What does the average material Western girl use in her lifetime, just for the fact that she's a, a, a girl? So what we came up with is instead of the material girl story, we wanted to tell the eco-material girl story, right? So we created this simple guide to reducing waste <coughs> below the waste. <laughs> All right. And we're going to follow the story of our little friend. Her name is Lisa. We named her Little Lisa from the time she's an infant until she's an old woman. So chapter one, Little Lisa's infancy. Now, who has an idea as to why an infant little baby girl born in the West, by the time she's two years old, has a much huger ecological footprint, a much bigger impact on the environment than a baby born in another part of the world? Who has an idea? Diapers. That's right, you're so smart. <laughs> Diapers. So the average Western baby, check this out, Actually, in the time that they use diapers, we'll have acquired a two-ton pile of diapers. Two tons. That's like this mountain over here. Now imagine every baby you've ever met. Now imagine all your friends. Now imagine your parents and imagine your kids. And all of us have created this huge two-ton pile. And in these diapers, there are plastics that don't biodegrade for 500 years. So they're extracted on this end, they're used, and then, oops, <laughs> that was my secret side. They're used, and then they just end up in the landfill. So what's the solution to this? <coughs> Reusable diapers, maybe? And I got to tell you, the diapers that they make these days, the reusable ones, these are not your mama's diapers. <laughs> these diapers, I remember when my little brothers were little, we had these pieces of white cloth, you know, the nappies. And you'd have to like wrap them up, and then there was these pins. I was always afraid I was going to poke myself or poke the baby when I was putting those things on. And then there are these plastic covers, and they're really weird looking. And, and reusable diapers these days are really cute. And they have these little plastic covers on the outside. They have snaps. You can get one set of like, I don't know, 15 or 20, however you think, many you think you need when your baby is an infant, and use them until they're done using diapers. Think of all the money you can save. <laughs> Think of the waste you can stop 
your baby from producing. There, uh, another thing to keep in mind, there are parts of the world where people don't have diapers. What do they do? Maybe we should start learning from them. So now little Lisa's growing up. She's not an infant anymore. Now she's becoming a woman. She's a growing girl. And what does that mean she needs? That's right, pads and tampons. <laughs> so there are 12 billion sanitary pads and 7 billion uh, tampons that end up in landfills in the US every year. Just think about that number. We're talking like bailout number size, right? Like that's huge. The average woman will use 150 kilograms of tampons and pads in her lifetime. 150 kilograms might not sound like that much, but actually, that's how much Andreas Johannesson, the Swedish weightlifter, weighs. So imagine this guy's weight in tampons. And that's what we're dealing with. That's the amount of waste that's coming from us. Just one person. So what would the eco-material girls' alternative be? They have reusable towels these days, just like the diapers. They're made from organic fabric. You can just throw them into your laundry significant cost savings if you consider how much you spend over your lifetime. And then, of course, there's the tampon alternative also. This is only one product, but there are many, many out there. And basically, the way it works is a squishy little thing, and you just stick it up there, and it catches all the gook, and you don't even have to worry about it. So <laughs> this one's called the Moon Cup. It lasts for 10 years. I don't work for them or anything. I just think this is really cool. And it costs 5,400 kroner, and you have it for 10 years. Look at how much money the average woman would spend over that amount of time buying, buying, buying tampons and pads at, and extracting and dumping and extracting and dumping. And it's just astonishing that more people don't do this. So now little Lisa, she's you know, been reproductive age for a while and she's growing up. <laughs> it's time to start talking about sex and condoms. Now sadly, not all condoms are biodegradable, but, uh, and there are plastics in the packaging and they're kind of icky. However, I'm just gonna read this disclaimer because while they're made of plastics that can take a long time to biodegrade in nature, it's the opinion of this presenter that benefits of condoms as birth control and sexually transmitted disease such as HIV AIDS prevention greatly outweighs the environmental cost in terms of closing the materials loop. Please, 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 please wear condoms, please. <laughs> so the eco-material girls' alternative possibilities to condoms, they have fair trade condoms these days, they have vegan condoms these days, they have lambskin condoms these days. The options are out there. So really, oh. So what are you going to do with all the leftover condoms? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, chapter four. This part's just for fun. We'll blaze through. So this is an organically made cotton set of lingerie. Very exciting. You can help the planet. Does anybody know what this is? Raise your hand. Just kidding, don't raise your hand. <laughs> this is a rabbit vibrator that was popularized by Sex in the City in the early 2000s. And the cool part about, well, there's lots of cool parts, I'm sure, about this vibrator. <laughs> but the cool part about this particular vibrator is that the people who made it realized that there was a need for, uh, for, for women who didn't want to make more waste just by having this one little simple pleasure in their life. So the people who make the rabbit vibrator said, you know what, when you're done using your vibrator, when you don't want it anymore, just take it back to the store. We'll take it, we'll take it apart, we'll recycle it, and we'll use it to make new vibrators. And you can buy another one at a discounted price. Why don't we do that with everything? That is so freaking cool. And there's many more ecologically friendly sex toys. Who knew? Who knew this stuff was out there? There are solar powered vibrators. <laughs> there are ones that have no batteries that you crank with your hands. And there's organic lubricants and, and all these like recyclable solar powered vibrators. They're made of glass sometimes, which I'm told is very, you know, temperature sensitive. No, you know. And and so the main point of all this <laughs> is that this has kind of been a silly look back at a few kind of strange products, but, but we can really take home this message that if these alternatives are out there for something as strange as sex toys, then they are definitely out there for things that we use in our everyday lives, things that we buy that can help us reduce our impact on the environment and close the materials loop and make the world more sustainable just by the purchases we make, by the small, small, small decisions that we make every day to support this bigger idea. So now that little Lisa's an old lady and she's looking back over her life, what kind of stuff would she see? Well, if she was like the average American and probably like the average Westerner, she has produced about two kilograms of garbage every single day. 
And keep in mind the garbage doesn't mean that it's going to the, just mean that it's going to the landfills. It means this is stuff that was extracted, raw materials from the earth, and then used and processed, and then thrown into the landfill. She probably produces, that amounts to about 13 kilograms a week, 726 kilograms a year over the, the centimeter eight, you know, eight centimeter lifetime. <laughs> and she uses about 100 rolls of toilet paper every single year. Now this is the part that really gets to me because we as scientists know that climate change is happening. We as people know that climate change is happening. We know it's happening because we have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And yet we're still cutting down our carbon sinks to wipe our asses. Like this is a flaw in logic, <laughs> okay? And it's what made a, a writer for the UK Guardian say that the American taste for toilet, uh, the soft toilet roll is worse for the environment than driving Hummers. Because we end up producing or using 100 rolls of toilet paper every single year. And they, they're made from trees. They're made from carbon sinks. They're supposed to stay as trees. <laughs> they're not supposed to wipe our butts. So. I'd like you to think about this for just a second. That toilet paper wasn't invented until 1880. What did people use before? What do people use where they don't have toilet paper? Water, things that you can reuse, just like the sanitary towels. So when I talk about closing the materials loop, let's get back to this. What is an alternative vision? This isn't a loop, this is a line. This is extraction, use, dump. What's the alternative? Looks a little more like this, that the manufacturers use recycled products to make recyclable materials that we then use and recycle so that we're not always taking and we're not always dumping. And thank you to the following eco-material girls who helped with this presentation. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>